let's just talk? Yeah, let's just Okay, talk. let's just talk. So I was like, um, do I need more coffee? No, I gotta have coffee. <laughs> do you are you familiar with the habit of mind? Uh yes. Yes. Yeah, yes, that's yes. really what I work with. Uh, for myself even I have it kind of posted in there and I'm looking at and thinking about and what I'm offering to the children Do they have those habits in mind which are kind of foundational for innovation? Well the, um, the schools of Reggio Emilia are my prime inspiration at this point and I think it's because it, it's different than my other inspirations and even the framework because it's an open system that just continues to evolve. So I feel like rather than studying Waldorf, which is actually also an inspiration way back <laughs> from early on, I let a lot of it go and then there's parts of it that just come back because they're so wholesome and healthy for children and serve children so well in environments. But Reggio is an evolving pedagogy and so I feel like I'm learning alongside those teachers, um, the whole thing that they're doing, that we're learning together, almost that I'm in dialogue with them. Um, and I've only been there once. I hope to go again, but it's not about actually having a conversation with them. It's about reading their work, looking at what they're doing, and talking to other practitioners that try to work in the same approach. Describe that evolving aspect of Reggio Emilia. This is, this is something I definitely have understood about their approach as well. You know, what do you mean by evolving? What do you what what makes you think that what Reggio is doing is constantly evolving? Well, just the way they came up with their initial philosophy with Loris Malguzzi and everything. It wasn't about um, one man writing a book. You know, or even one beautiful, peaceful female figure developing a framework um, that's been written and then here it is for us to learn, like the Bible or something, and it just, the more you adhere to it in different ways or interpret it, but it's static. Um, the work they're doing in Reggio is constantly evolving for them, and they're very transparent about that. Yeah, I mean, so I just remember in the, I think it in hundred languages of children is that first first chapter in it where they're interviewing Loris, and you know he's like, we drew inspiration from biology, from science, from psychology, which was um, uh, he in, in his words I think he said which was controversial at the time to draw from psychology, which is now it's like. A lot of what we yeah. do and understand about teaching is drawn from psychology. And, you know, I've kind of understood that about their practice as well as this idea of, um, I think of it like a membrane. Like the Reggio approach is like a membrane. It's a way of having things pass through and some things don't pass through mm -hmm. and, and there's this back and forth nature. Um, what do you think about that metaphor? I love it because when they come, like when they come to Oregon and go to football school, um, you could tell by being with them, um, and they've been to PSU before too, that they are really eagerly listening to and learning from what they see and what they hear and current trends and just like Howard Gardner getting involved in, they haven't, it is not writ. Right, right. It, it is a dialogue. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, and actually this is a pretty good segue, you know, I think this idea that we're talking about, about the evolving aspect of their approach is um, really visible in their concept of atelier, their, their studios, of bringing in artists, right? Bringing in people who are artists, or not just artists, because they brought in dancers and um, architects and, you know, pe people of various fields, but having them be teachers in the school, mm -hmm. right? And then doing long-term project work with the children. Is that your um, interpretation of the atelier? Would you add to that? Or what, what, what is your kind of understanding of the atelier? Well, it is just that. And I remember once someone saying it's about offering the very best of your culture to them not the best of their culture. And so I, I always go back to that when I'm here with the children. And I almost feel like the whole school is an atelier, really. Because 
everything is flexible here and everything is changing based on the group of children and families we have. And me too, I also get to be a part of that. What is the best of Portland culture? Right. What are the children and families interested in? What can I bring in to help further their questions and their wonderings? The first thing I notice when I kind of walk into your school is just how beautiful everything is. It's just, it's a very beautiful space, very thoughtful, a lot of attention went into very, very small details. And, um, you know, you just mentioned that, uh, you know, the concept of atelier is something that you apply to uh, what I think you said every area of your classroom, right? Yeah, I would have trouble thinking of an exception. <laughs> Well, I'll talk briefly about that and then I'll talk about some materials that I am on the fence about, that I continue to be on the fence about and it will help kind of delineate. So I just think about intelligent materials. Um, for these materials here, they have multiple uses. Um, children can use them for construction, they can line them up on the ground, they can use them at the light table. Um, right now they're really interested in light and color, so they often turn this table off and use all these little tea lights together or these silly little things that I've had for years. I've kind of tucked away on the shelf because they look pretty and forgot about them. And the children take them and they've been running around the classroom with each other, looking at each other, and it becomes a way to connect with one another. So just when I was ready to recycle these, they had another use other than light and color. Mm -hmm. um, so some materials, well, I, I guess, markers, paper, paint and clay, things that have multiple uses. Uh, I like doing small worlds and having animals. Some of the only representational toys in the room will be these, I have millions of these sturdy plastic animals. And I feel like the first time I saw them with them, I thought, that's okay. I can get a wolf that looks like a wolf. And <laughs> now I understand children are so connected to animals when they play in small worlds with each other. There's, the stories that come out are amazing, so it's worth it for me to get something representational. Things I'm on the fence about are Legos. And over the years, they've come and gone. I see children using them in particular ways to just kind of reenact media scenarios like Star Wars or something. And it bothers me because not everyone's seen Star Wars, not everyone has Legos at home, and so it becomes kind of a materialistic thing. And what I used to tell them is no media, kind of Waldorf style, just no media in the classroom. Um, and then I interpreted it later in a more, I think, I, would, I guess I'd say Reggie in a way, where I said, I'm hoping the stories we tell here at school, everyone can connect to. And maybe not everyone's seen Frozen. Well, Frozen was a problem because everyone said, oh yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I want us to, I don't want someone to be able to correct another child and say, well, that's not how it goes. I want them, I want us to co-create our narrative together and they understand that. So Legos and Playmobiles are the other thing. Playmobiles are so fun, but I, I don't want them to be using things at school that they could use at home. And that's something I feel like a lot of children have access to. And I hope they have materials here that do encourage them to connect and be creative in different ways than they are in their living room on a rainy day. You think so about... So funny, you would yeah. say that. <laughs> um, someone um, just brought in a picture, a still frame from the computer that has a graphic designer printed up from a movie, Someone's Castle. Um, Hell's Moving Castle? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And my carpool kids had just been talking about it and really telling me I need to see it, and so I knew it was a really rich artistic work, so I probably had a bias mm -hmm. towards it as opposed to, I don't know, Shrek or something. Mm -hmm. Right. So maybe that's why I let it in. But he came in one day, and he started talking about the movie and showing the picture, and I kind of ushered it away, like, you can show this with your friends, but I'd really appreciate you just not talk about the movie because kids haven't seen it. So talk mm -hmm. about this castle that you're so intrigued with. Mm -hmm. And he did. And then he, kids were really fascinated at our classroom meeting. Really, my intention was to have him bring it in, show it, put it away, and get on with our real work. And it became clear 
that that was our real work, to spend 10 minutes looking at this picture and talk about the teeth and what does it eat. I don't know if you've seen The Moving Castle. Uh, and then he came in the next day with two more pictures. And then I was watching what children were drawing and some of what they were drawing was, were pictures of the moving castle. So I can see it's gonna become a thing. It is gonna launch a thing. And it got me excited about, I have all these books about construction, um, how things are built. I don't know if you know these books, I can pull them out. But it's a whole direction we can go in where clearly they were interested in the mechanics of the thing. The child who brought it in wants to build it himself, um, to actually build it. So I'm hoping they'll start with a plan and then in that time that they're making their plans on paper, I yeah. can quickly figure out how the heck we could build something like that. His idea is he's gonna build something that moves. Right, okay, so that's, that's so interesting because I think there is in folklore, if we wanna call it folklore, sometimes it's just commercial. I think there is this rich history of like, inanimate objects having some kind of life or oh, yeah. soul or personality. So I think of Harry Potter, right, and, and Hogwarts and how the building has its, you know, intricacies and it's it has a persona, right? You yeah. could describe it with uh, words that you would describe a person. Yeah. Um, or there's the idea of transformers, right, where this inanimate object yeah. comes to life and becomes this protector of humanity. Um, you know, that's an, that's funny because when you were describing what was happening, like you were describing uh, one of the directions that you're thinking about heading into is construction. And in my mind, I'm thinking about inanimate objects having life and soul yeah. and, and, sto and the storytelling aspects of that. How do you decide what direction to go in? You know, if, if you're gonna focus on that construction side of it or this, what I just described, mm -hmm. Like, what's your thought process? Well, I try to listen to the children and observe what they're really getting at. Like, what is so fascinating to them about this castle? There was a lot of talk about what it eats, its teeth. And so I could immediately jump to, oh, I've got this great idea, we'll do this tomorrow. Awesome. And that would be one way to go. But if I'm able to sit back for a little while and listen to their conversations to find out what is what they really need out of it. and. I have misinterpreted many times. I remember a child, we had a whole tinkering station set up in here and it was the year of just making stuff. And I had certain materials in here, certain materials that were not in here. And one day I remember him riding around, riding a bike outside in circles, just crying. And I came over to him and was talking to him and he said, I'm so tired of wood and bark and cardboard and stuff that's brown and all I want is like metal and sharp things and screws. You know, he's crying as he's saying it. I just had this huge realization that I was putting out things I found to be aesthetically beautiful for them to construct. And he really had this image of making something robotic. Mm -hmm. And my suspicion is that when these children do whatever they're gonna do, that that's partly what it's about. They're already talking about stuff that moves. Right. So I'm going to need to pull in some backup. Right. Um, there's a dad who built robots here. I'm going to need help. Okay. We'll just try to hang back and watch. I, mean, I sometimes do get more excited, just unable to control myself with excitement about a direction. That's one thing teachers do when you have to give yourself the grace of saying, oh, I totally jumped the gun on that one. Yeah. Um, but if you can hang back and watch, and offer a variation of it, kind of that ball toss. Mm -hmm. Like in Small Worlds, for example, there's, um, we had this thing with dogs last year with dogs, wolves, um, different aged dogs and wolves, and um, clay caves and rocks set up in rugged environments, and everyone wanted to go to it every day, and they'd fight over. So we just expanded it to have it be a whole huge table. and. It turned out to be about the families, about who's protecting who and who lives where, uh, and it took a long time to figure out what exactly it was that they were interested in. There's a lot of ways I could have flown with it that may have kept their interest but lost the thread of what was core to them. Um, something that I've done is I've noticed something that the children were doing, and then I offered a provocation to kind of test my assumptions yeah. about what I thought might be going on. Have you ever done anything like that? Oh yeah. 
I'm trying to think of a specific instance, but I can't. <laughs> I think I have one. Um, a couple years ago, we did this thing called The Night Scene, where children were loved this book about someone who's drawing at night, and when he shines a flashlight on what he's drawing, that part of the page lights up. So the whole double page is black, and then there'll be just a triangle of light shining on a wolf or a squirrel in the forest. And so they love this book. So we set up this whole area with a giant piece of paper and we, um, black paper and closed it in so it was really dark, and just a couple candle lights in there the electric kind and white chalk and we were like yeah we've totally got this we gave them flashlights and they weren't so interested they kept getting little animals or puppets to bring them over there to play with and we'd be like put that away look here's the white crayon here's the flashlight and then just over time we noticed that's really what their interest was but the puppets and that stuffed animals we have are too big and the little characters were too small so we made characters but it took a while uh, I think the whole setup kind of led us to what they eventually were interested in, but we didn't catch it at first. And sometimes their interests are evolving too. So I love that metaphor of the ball toss. You're going back and forth playing with an idea together until a clear theme emerges, if it does. Typically, and I know it's very different depending on the group, that idea of the ball toss, right? From the moment where you observe something that might be that might lead to some sort of long-term inquiry, to that moment where you feel like you have some clarity and that you as a group have some clarity about where things are going. Typically, how long do you think that process kind of takes? I can totally vary. That the night scene product was a whole year thing that ended in them making their own animals with our artillery stuff and creating whole scenes in here. They were exploring their personalities through their character they made and their relationships with each other. It was just this amazing. And I think, I hope for that every year, that there's gonna be this one thing we all congregate around and it evolves and it becomes this beautiful thing at the end of the year. But it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes these things are very short. Right now I'm in very short cycles mm -hmm. of interest. Yeah. And that might be how it is all year. So I have lots of journals and take notes, write things down. Um, if I'm not near it and I can't get up and run away, I might write it down on the dry erase board and take a picture of it. But ultimately, for me, the best form of observation is, is photographs because I take a million, I always have, and then when I go back and look at them, I see things I didn't notice the first time around. Um, themes emerging someone's always playing alone or something comes out of them when I look carefully. When I'm doing conferences, I put together photo albums of each child. And as I'm putting those together, stories of the child and who they are, the picture of who they are kind of jumps off the pictures to me. So that's really the best form for me. I'm a visual thinker. Well, the thing that comes to mind is just advice for kind of your audience of folks that are working on, on developing constructivist places to be with children. It's just that it's a journey and that you're all in it together with the children and it will have lots of bumps on it and there'll be times you don't know what you're doing or you've made a mistake and it doesn't matter in the long run. It's just that connection to children and that dialogue that's happening with them. And when you're on track with them, you, you can feel it and they can feel it and and the parents will feel it and understand it.